been so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me We really bow before someone great. When we pray, we need to know whom it is that we bow before. We're going to go through a four-week sermon series on learning how to pray more effectively. This will be part one, and it starts today and goes through September 29th. Here's the various aspects of prayer. There's approaching and honoring. There's loving and desiring. There's confessing and repenting. There's listening to God and speaking to God. There is dying to self and obeying God. There's enjoying God in that personal relationship and then sharing what you've learned about God with those that do not know him. So we're going to be going through these aspects of prayer over the next four weeks. And so today it's going to be part one. How do we approach God? How do we honor God? Well, let's find out. When we pray... Many Christians often tend to just think of Jesus as we see him in our minds in the Gospels. We see Jesus as just a man. A simple man walking around town dressed in a long white or maybe an ivory colored robe like the typical Jewish man would wear in the first century. We see Jesus in dirty sandals uh, with a beard and uh, very possibly long flowing hair as we have seen him portrayed in Christian movies. We also picture Jesus with other men and women around him as he walks along a street. We picture Jesus sometimes just sitting quietly on a large rock or maybe a stone ledge, uh, talking with his disciples and teaching them his truth. We sometimes picture Jesus in an upper room where he and all of the other disciples are sitting around very low tables on the floor. And they're eating the last supper together before Jesus goes to the cross to be crucified. We sometimes picture Jesus, hands bound with rope, and standing before the Pharisees and high priest on trial being mocked, insulted, and slapped. We sometimes see horrific pictures in our minds of Jesus being horribly beaten by the Roman soldiers. Those of us that have seen the movie The Passion of the Christ have images in our heads that we wish we had not seen. It is almost too graphic to watch our Savior being violently beaten and bloody. But that is all an earthly picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus is now back in heaven. He has received back his full glory that he had previous to his coming to earth as a baby and growing up into a fully grown man, being fully man and fully God. When Jesus ascended back into heaven... After his resurrection from the dead, he sat down on his throne at the right hand of his Father. Jesus is on a throne filled with glory, majesty, splendor, power, and strength, and a beauty that you and I cannot possibly imagine. Therefore, Jesus' 12 disciples can no longer just come into his presence the way they once did while he was here on earth. They approached Jesus as simply an earthly man who had laid aside his glory. Now, everyone that desires to draw near to Jesus must realize that they are coming before a God who is now back in his state of full glory, honor, splendor, and might. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the majesty on high. He is exalted and thousands and thousands of angels fly all around him as he sits on his throne saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lamb of God. I had a teacher in seminary who talked about from the Hebrew what it was like for these angelic beings to be able to to sing and to say and to speak to Almighty God there in his presence and it said they just almost can't even say the words holy because he's just so holy and he would go holy 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 is the Lord God Almighty because he's too holy almost to pronounce listen to these verses in God's Word Psalm 47 8 God reigns over the nations God sits on his holy throne. 1 Kings 22:19. 19. Micaiah said, 
Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right and on his left. Now let's read Isaiah 6, 1 through 5. Isaiah, a regular man, actually was lifted up and being able to see what it was like to see God in person yet not die. Isaiah 6, verse 1. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted with the train of his robe filling the temple. How big was that robe? Verse 2, seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I'm reading through a book on prayer right now that is revolutionizing my life, especially my prayer life. I can't put it down. When I'm reading it, I find myself lifted up to the heavens in my mind and my heart, and I feel as if I'm seeing a very different picture of who it is that I'm really talking to in my prayers. This book is by Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon is known as the Prince of Preachers. This man drew so close to Jesus Christ during his life as a man, a husband, and as a pastor of a church in England. Listen to how Spurgeon describes who the Heavenly Father is and who Jesus is and where they are in the temple of God in heaven. They are sitting on the throne. Two more things you must know about Charles Spurgeon before I read his quote. Number one, Spurgeon lived under a king. He did not live in a country that uh, had a democracy. He lived in a country where his government was led by a king. He was a monarch. Number two, Spurgeon lived during the Second Great Awakening. He saw King Jesus doing incredible, unexplained things in people's lives and even in his entire country. That said, listen to this portion of Spurgeon's focus on prayer to our King Jesus on his heavenly throne. Quote, the throne of grace, that God is to be viewed in prayer as our Father is the aspect that is dearest to us. But we are still not to regard him as though he were such as we are, for our Savior has qualified our Father with the words, which art in heaven. Close at the heels of that condescending name to remind us that our Father is still infinitely greater than ourselves, he bids us say, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Matthew 6, 9 through 10. Our Father is to be regarded as a king, and in prayer we come not only to our Father's feet, but also to the throne of the great monarch of the universe. The mercy seat is a throne, and we must not forget this. If we should always regard prayer as an entrance into the courts of the royalty of heaven, and if we are to behave ourselves as courtiers in the presence of an illustrious majesty, we are not at a loss to know the right spirit in which to pray. If in prayer we come to a throne, it is clear that our spirit should, in the first place, be one of lowly reverence. It is expected that the courtier, in approaching the king, should pay the king homage and honor. The pride that will not acknowledge the king and the treason that rebels against the sovereign should, if it is wise, avoid any near approach to the throne. Let pride bite the curb at a distance. Let treason lurk in corners, for only lowly reverence may come before the king himself when he sits clothed in his robes of majesty. In our case, the king before whom we come is the highest of all monarchs, the king of kings and the lord of lords. My soul, be sure that when you draw near to the omnipotent, who is as a consuming fire, put your shoes off 
your feet and worship him with lowliest humility. He is the most holy of all kings. His throne is a great white throne, unspotted and clear as crystal. The stars are not pure in his sight. How much less a man that is a worm. Job 25, 5 through 6. With what lowliness should you draw near to him? Familiarity there may be, but let it not be unhallowed. Boldness there should be, but let it not be impertinent. You are still on earth, and he is still in heaven. You are still a worm of the dust, and he the everlasting. Before the mountains were brought forth, he was God. And if all of the created things should pass away, yet he would still be the same. I am afraid we do not bow as we should before the eternal majesty. Let us ask the Spirit of God to put us in a right frame that every one of our prayers may be a reverential approach to the infinite majesty above. End quote. Spurgeon goes on to say that God's throne is to be approached in this manner. We are to approach God's throne uh, as a design to be clean and righteous from our walking daily in sin. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. The spiritual God seeks spiritual worshipers, and such he will accept and only such. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But he's, the prayer of a righteous, upright person is his delight. Proverbs 15, 8. Listen to that again. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. What this means is when a person living in wickedness and sin prays to God, God considers their prayer an abomination. Are you living in sin right now and will not confess and repent? If you are, then when you pray, God sees your prayers and abomination before his holy throne. If you are living upright and holy in Jesus Christ, then when you pray, God sees your prayer as his delight. We are to approach God's throne as a throne of grace and justice. We are to approach God's throne with complete submission. We are to approach God's throne with the deepest sincerity. We are to approach God's throne with devout joyfulness. We are to approach God's throne with enlarged expectations. Why? Because he is a great God who can do great things. Amen? We are to approach God's throne with unstaggering confidence. Why? Because he has told us to have faith in him, to live in him in truth, and because he has promised to answer our prayers. Finally, as we're learning how to pray more effectively, listen to God's word in the book of Revelation. Now, here's at the very end of God's word. Revelation 5, 1 through 14. This is the section of Revelation where it's, they're looking for who can open the book of seven seals. Look at where the Father and Jesus are seated. Revelation 5, starting in verse 1, going to 14. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel approaching with a loud voice. Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the thrones with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. 
Now, in this section, the angels around the throne of God exalt the Lamb in Jesus Christ. Verse 11, Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, and the numbers of them were myriads of myriads and thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Now, listen to this. Listen carefully to who comes and sits with Jesus on his throne at the end of time. This is so awesome. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. And as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He's going to give us, the ones that gave, had the opportunity to really serve him and love him and walk with him, and we overcame all of those trials that came before us, he is going to grant us to be able to sit down with him on his throne. That can only be something as a source of an incredible focus for us, is that we want to work one day toward standing before Jesus and this throne and seeing our Father and Jesus as they truly are in their full glory right now. So now, church, in what spirit and manner are you and I going to be approaching God when we pray? How are you and I going to honor God when you and I approach Him in prayer? Honoring God must be a priority for those who take their relationship with Him seriously. I'm not asking you through this sermon series to just come before God in formality. I'm not asking you to get formal with your prayers and O oh, thou majestic God in the heavens, I come before you as just a saint, as a sinner saved by grace. And I'm not asking you to come to God that way. I'm just saying that you need to know whom it is to whom you pray. You need to realize that he is other. He is God. He is holy. He is filled with splendor. He is majestic. He is righteous. He is larger than anything you can possibly imagine. There is no sin in heaven. And angelic beings fly in his presence. And as they fly, they cover their eyes with two of their wings. And then with their feet, they cover with other two wings. And then with the other two, they fly. And they're just saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. Almighty. I mean, it's an incredibly powerful place. But in Hebrews, how are we told to come into the presence of God when we want to pray? We're told to come boldly to the throne of grace. But remember, you're coming to a throne. And a lot of times we don't talk about that. We just talk about Jesus as our brother. He's also our teacher. He's also our friend. We used to see John when they would have dinners together. He'd lay his head on Jesus' chest. That was Jesus without his glory. That was Jesus without his being exalted back into the heaven and his robe of righteousness and him sitting on the throne and the crown. This is totally different. So when we pray to the Heavenly Father and we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, we should expect powerful things to happen. So it's not necessarily that we need to pray more in our Christian life. That may be true for you. Maybe quantity is something you need to do as far as praying more to God, but I'm here to suggest that what time you are spending before the throne of grace, that you are coming before God having a little bit more of an understanding of who He is, where He resides, where He sits, and how He listens. Listen, if you're walking through life and you're a Christian and you're living in sin, and yet you're still praying for God to bless you, and you won't stop your sin. You just continue right on in your sin. And you just say, well, I can't do anything about it. I've tried. And you come and pray to God. God says, that is an abomination to me. That is filth to me. Get it out of my presence. Because he is holy. You need to come to God and confess your sin and say, God, I can't approach a throne without confessing the evil that's in my life, the sin that's in my life, this horrible wickedness that's in my life. Whatever it is. I confess it because I want to come up close to your throne. I want to come into your presence as close as I can possibly get. I ask you 
to forgive me of my sins. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us and purify us from all unrighteousness. And then I want to approach the throne with boldness. Once I get my sin dealt with God, then I want to just be in my Father's presence, be in my King's presence, and bow. That's why we talk a lot about praying on our knees. When's the last time you prayed on your knees? Is it all just kind of like driving down the road and praying for better health, praying for better money, praying for a promotion, praying for this, praying for a long weekend, praying for that, praying for a great parking spot at Target? I mean, what are we using our prayers for? We're talking to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and we got just a little bit of a taste of what it looked like to be in a coronation just of Queen Elizabeth in 1953 by that earlier video. When we come into the presence of the King, that's who we're praying to. So when we approach the throne of grace, every time we pray, we need to really think about what we're going to say when we approach the majesty, when we approach a holy God, a righteous God, now, he is a very merciful God, a very loving God, a very kind God, a very grace-filled God. But he is also holy. He's also a father, and he puts up with no pretense. And he knows when you're just not living according to his word, and yet you're still trying to come and get blessings. God is not in a bottle, and he's a genie, and you get prayer as your three wishes. You need to realize who it is that you're talking to. And so when you go to pray... Start out by saying, God, I'm a sinner. If it were not for Jesus' death and burial and resurrection and him paying for my penalty of my sin, I would go to hell. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. But, Lord, I've not been walking in your truth. He said, I seek worshipers that are in spirit and truth, not just having the Holy Spirit and walking in falsehood, but walking in the truth. I want my prayer life to deepen. I think as believers, we are supposed to be growing in the knowledge of the Word of God. We need to study, and we need to grow in our effectiveness in prayer. Over in James in 5.16, it says, The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective, or it avails much. The prayer of a righteous person, well, the prayer of an unrighteous person doesn't avail anything. And so a lot of times when we pray and we're not seeing God move, we're not seeing God answers, maybe we're not living as a righteous person. And we're continuing to pray, and God is saying in Psalm 66, 18, I'm not listening, I'm not listening, I'm not listening, I'm not listening. Because if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Bible says God will not hear. Why? Because he's a holy God, not because he doesn't care. But you're approaching holiness, you're approaching righteousness. And so when the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray, he jumped on, he said, Absolutely. My Father. He didn't even say pray to himself. He said, my Father, our Father, who art in heaven. Meaning, you got to realize, you're down here, guys. It's totally different to the man that you're praying to, to that God you're praying to. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Come in a manner in which reverences God, that holds God in awe. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Meaning you're already saying to God in your prayer, I'm not after you doing things after my will. What is your will? What is your kingdom's desire? May that come down and be here on earth and even where I reside. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus was trying to say, you need to realize who you're praying to. So as we walk through this four weeks, I'm not asking you to get all formal with your words and use thee, thou, and though. I'm not asking you to do that. But I do think it's very paramount that we realize that Jesus has ascended. He now has his robe of righteousness on. He has his train that fills the temple. And it also fills with smoke and trembles when even the angels speak. That passage I read out of Isaiah 6, 1 through 5, the, 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 the foundations trembled when the angels spoke. That wasn't even God speaking. It filled with smoke and the foundation trembled when just an angel spoke. God hasn't even spoken yet. Can you imagine what happens when the divine begins to speak? So how many of you have walked through life and you've prayed and sometimes you said, well, I've done all I could. All I can do now is pray. All I can do now is pray to a really holy God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the one that is full of majesty and splendor and joy and beauty, sits in the heavens and nothing is possible with God. He's the only one I can talk to about it now. I've done all I can. Hopeless situation. But I'll pray, give it a shot. That is not approaching God 
in his holiness and it's not honoring to God in your prayer to say, all I can do is pray. I've done everything. Who can do more in your situation? God or you? God or you? Well, you've done all you can do. And he's like, well, I guess we'll see if there's anything he might can do in this situation. So as you pray this week, try to pray with a new heart. Try to pray with a new focus. Try to pray with a new frame of mind that when you go to talk to God, realize that he's in heaven and you're on earth and that he's a holy God and he's a king. When you pray, do you pray to a king? That's what I want to happen in my prayer life is to realize that, oh God, you are alive. You are well. You are on your throne. You're in control. You're sovereign. And you've commanded me to pray. We're going to get into sections in the next couple of weeks. We're commanded to pray. You can't not pray. You have to pray. We're commanded to pray by this king that commands us to pray. But how do we pray? How do we approach God? How do we honor God in our prayer? Start spending more time with God this week, but also focus on praying more effectively. Get your heart right. Get your soul right. Get your attitude right. Sometimes we go to God angry and we just go all off on God. Do you know who you're speaking to? Remember who you're in the presence are. You're in his courts, and you're a courtier. And so God is allowing you into his courts of praise. Be careful how you approach the throne of the king. Be careful how you honor or dishonor God as you're coming into his presence. Let's stand and let's sing a song that is very powerful called Majesty.